We are part of a movement, a God-given vision and purpose to help every person and every generation experience God in everyday life. He has called us to fulfill a divine plan, to end cycles of unhealthy decisions, abuse, broken marriages, and personal defeat, to realize our full potential as His sons and daughters, to experience His life-changing power and purpose for our lives, our families, our church, and our region. We will invest our lives to leave a legacy, and God's vision for our church will be fulfilled. All right, this weekend we're in week two of the Fulfilled series, and it's part of a capital campaign that we're doing. If you're a guest, ignore the capital campaign part, but don't ignore the message, because it is irrelevant for you as it is for anybody else. But I want to take some time this week, and as we talk about the, the, the campaign, the message of Fulfilled, I want to take some time and help you to understand what it means to leave a legacy. In fact, let me remind you now before I forget, we're going to celebrate communion at the end of the service today. So don't run out and leave. We're going to, we're going to worship at the end a bit. I, I, I know the time. And by the way, it's, it's a bye week. The Steelers aren't playing today, so calm down. Okay? But, uh, but we're going to celebrate communion at the end of the service. And so please make sure you stick around for that. And we'll make sure you have these. If you have not yet gotten one, we'll make sure at the end of the service, the ushers will give you that opportunity. But I want to encourage you today to understand what it means to live a fulfilled life. God has called us as a church to do the mission of Jesus. And we are reaching out, not just here at this church, but God's put it in our heart to help 300 other churches to see ministry from a posture of doing the works of Jesus, to going into a broken world where those who, with whom we disagree or those who maybe are, are trapped in darkness are not our enemies. They're, they are our mission. They are the people that Jesus loved and that he died for. And if he loved them and if he died for them, then we love them. And we will sacrifice our lives to bring the gospel to them. Whether they accept or reject our, our God, whether they accept or reject Christ is between them and God. But it's our job to be that mission field, to go out and, and be Jesus to our generation. Our role as the church is literally to fill this place with people that don't know God. You know, every weekend you have an opportunity to, to bring someone to Christ. And, and one of the easiest ways you can be an influence in someone's spiritual life is bring them to a service. We work very diligently here to create an atmosphere where people feel welcome no matter if they're close to God or they're far from God. Everything I prepare, I prepare with everyone in mind, not just Christians. And so why don't we partner together? I, I promise you that you, you can come here and you can expect that we will do our very best to present the message of a Savior to anyone that you bring. But the more people that we can, can bring into the kingdom of God, we are called as believers to literally populate heaven and plunder hell. And so the fulfilled campaign, part of it is we are going to fill this facility with people that don't know Jesus. Are you believe in God with me for that? Come on, if this world ever needed the church, it's right now, man. If this world ever needed the church to rise up and be the church, it is absolutely right now. The, part of the campaign, we are filling God's people with his word. We are filling our children with his word. Ah, man, we'll get into some of that in a minute. We are filling our world with the hope of the gospel. But lastly, let me say this. If you don't live your life for something bigger than your life, if you don't live your life simply just but to solve your next problem, to pay your next bill, to go on your next vacation, to get your next whatever, to achieve your next whatever, if that's all you live your life for, you will never live a fulfilled life, ever. Part of this message as well is to teach you how to truly live a fulfilled life. A fulfilled life is when you live your life beyond your four and no more. It's when you devote your life and take up your cross daily and follow Jesus and live for, for people that you've not yet met, people that you do not know, but live to serve the world that was without Christ and without God and without hope in the world. And I want to talk to you today specifically about leaving a legacy. When you leave today, either at, at Tunnel to, uh, 3 or Tunnel 2, you'll see right when you walk out, right on the wall there, you'll see it written, it will be fulfilled. And people have already started writing their declarations of faith. There's markers there, and I want you to go on that wall, and I want you to write what you're believing God for. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's for your kids. Maybe it's for your grandkids. Maybe, you're, maybe for issues in your own life that you're trusting God will be fulfilled in your life. 
And we're going to make those declarations and write those on that wall as an act of faith throughout this campaign. You know, when this building on this side was being built, we had people come that, that were part of our church at the time, and we, and we had a beam signing <clears throat> where people came into all the steel beams and we wrote our declarations of faith of what we would believe would happen in this building. And time and time again, I've had people come to me and say, you know, Pastor, the people's names I wrote on those beams that I was trusting God to touch have come to know Christ. And then some have even come to me and said, Pastor John, I was praying for my family, for my son, my daughter, their kids. And not only did God save them, not only did they come to Christ, they come to church here. They're sitting under the very beams, beside the very beams where their names are written behind the walls and the faithfulness of God. We are called to reach our world. We are called to reach our world for Christ, to reach our families, to use the influence of our life to lift and to help those people in this world that are without God and without hope. And so I want you to write those declarations. Add your faith to it. Join your heart to God's heart. The, this campaign is not about building a building. Whatever we build, someday will be torn down. It's about reaching into this broken world with the message of the gospel. Legacy is about fighting battles and winning battles. And while you do it, realize that you're planting trees that you will never live under the shade or eat its fruit. Legacy is when you live beyond your own life. In fact, today we're going to celebrate communion <clears throat> at the end of the service. And communion is really a celebration of the legacy of Jesus. And so legacy is not just winning battles in your life, but winning battles in your life that, that, that exceed your life, that are transposed into the next generation. In fact, our founding fathers got together when they wrote the Declaration of Independence. Sometimes we look back at that like they had this great, powerful kind of whatever. They didn't. They were under the subjection and dominance of England. And they got together, and these were people that were living pretty well. These are the people that had prospered. They were being taxed, they believed, too heavily, like a lot of people feel today. But anyway, uh, did I say that out loud again? Bad pastor. Bad pa but anyway, they, they, were going to, they wanted to be free from England, so they wrote a Declaration of Independence. And you have to understand, there's more people in this room today than there were at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. This was, this was a dream. And here's what they said. The last sentence of the declaration was this. We mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, fortunes and, and our sacred honor to one another. They, they said, we're willing to die for this. We're willing to take all that we've accumulated, our fortunes, and spend it for this purpose. And then they said, we're willing to invest our sacred honor. And if you know anything about the signers of the Declaration of Independence, many of them did give their lives for that, that, that dream. Many of them did, did give their fortunes, and many of them died penniless. But not one of them forfeited their sacred honor. And they died and invested for a dream that was America. Now, it's really important for us to understand that God's not an American. That, that might be a surprise to you, but I mean, you know he's not voting in the election. God is not an election. God is not an American. He will exist prior to and after this, this nation fails. Because there, eventually there is going to be a government that will rest upon his shoulders and his kingdom will not end. How many of you are looking forward when Jesus runs into government? Oh, thank you, Jesus. And in the meantime, we need to pray for godly leaders and be godly people. Because I can tell you this, no matter what happens on November 8th, we better be ready to be the church. Because whoever is president, we're going to be needing to pray in America. Everybody said, or oh me. So... You, we, they mutually pledged their lives, their fortunes, their honors together for a dream that was a nation. And God is so blessed and richly blessed our nation. But I find very often Christians in America are more devoted to their nation than they are their God. We need to be pledging our lives to the, to the gospel, our fortunes, if you will, to the gospel, our sacred honor to the propagation of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world because the only hope of this world is Jesus. That's it. And if he's the only hope of the world, then his church, the body, is the only hope of the world. In the Bible, the story of Noah is one of the greatest stories of legacy in the Bible. You know the story of Noah where God brought judgment on the earth. And there was a little girl, she was in her class, and the teacher asked this little, the kids, said, listen, I want you to write a story that's meaningful to you and a little essay. Little girl wrote about Noah. Teacher saw it and and he kind of pulled her out and made fun of her in front of the class and said, Noah, 
you, you believe this is real? She's just a little girl. And she said, well, yes, I do. The teacher said, well, I, I'm not sure that's real. And she said, well, when I go to heaven, I'm going to ask Noah about it. And the teacher said, well, so what when you get to heaven, what if Noah's not there? She said, well, then I guess you'll have to ask him. <laughs> there you go. Moral of the story. Don't mess with kids. <laughs> but sometimes we see God, even in judgment, as almost finding joy in it. You need to understand that when God brings judgment, it is because he is a righteous God. And yet God has done everything. In fact, the Bible said his mercy boasted against his judgment, that Jesus paid the debt that I couldn't pay. But I want to read to you out of Genesis what it was going on in the heart of God when man was walking far from God. You need to understand the picture of Noah. You're going to see Jesus in a few moments is telling us we need to consider Noah right now. Do you know right now the Bible is pointing to the day? Do you know the day we're living in is written in Scripture? Do you know that in Scripture it says a day will come when Russia will form an alliance with, with what is today modern-day Syria, with Persia, which is modern-day Iran, and they will form a military alliance and they will attack Israel? Has anybody read the paper recently or watched the news? These things are coming to pass in real time. And God actually tells us that we're to... We're going to understand the times of Noah in the last days. But let me read about it. In Genesis 6, verse 5, it says this. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth, on the earth had become. And at every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man. Now listen to this. And his heart was filled with pain. I want you to understand See God like a father or a mother. Anybody who has children or someone that you love intimately, when they go off the rails and start to, to live their lives apart from the, the plan and the purpose and the will of God, if you love that person and you see them going in a direction that's dangerous, your heart is grieved. You, you literally feel the burden and the grief and the pain of that person's decisions. And when God saw that man was only evil, he was doing, just literally wanted nothing to do with God or his ways. It filled God's heart with pain. And then God brought judgment through, through, through a flood and, and Noah was spared. And I'm going to talk to you about how important that is. Listen to what Jesus said about it in Matthew 24, verse 36. He said, no one knows about that day or hour of the coming of the Son of Man. Not the, even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Stop there. As it was in the days of Noah, it will be that way when Jesus returns. How was it in the days of Noah? The world, the entire culture was beginning to make decisions that were so against God that they sought to do what was contrary to God's heart all the time. Now, some of you in this room are younger and maybe in your 20s and 30s, and, and you may not remember a time when it was anything but what it is right now. Some of you may be in your teens and this is all you've ever known. But for some of us in this room, if you can go back 20 years and remember what it was like in this nation or 30 years or some 40. And if somebody would have told you that the, state, the status of our nation the status of our morality of this nation, when good would become evil and evil would become good, evil would be celebrated as good and good would be literally condemned as evil, you wouldn't have believed it. <clears throat> in the last days, we see all of the things in the Middle East coming together. We see cultures literally pointing their finger at God and, and saying nothing that God holds to be dear, nothing that God holds to be sacred in human life and human relationship is a valued, in fact, celebrating the very opposite of those things and condemning those that literally would walk with God and serve him. We're living in that time, and we're living in it right now. Verse 38 says, For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Now well, listen, this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. We are told 
to look to Noah when these days come. We are told to look not only to what happened to the world, what happened to those who oppose God, because there is coming a judgment on the earth. And, I, and, and I'm so grateful, I am so grateful that the scripture says for those that are children of God, those that have come to Christ, that we are not appointed unto God's wrath. Aren't you glad that the wrath of God ain't coming on you because you've received mercy? I am so thankful for that. If you've ever had a time to clap and thank God, baby, that is right there. Because you read the book of Revelation, it'd be some stuff coming. And I'm glad to miss it all. But there is, a, in fact, the Bible said when the judgments of God will fall, that people will actually point their God finger at God while he's judging them and curse him. That's some stupid people. That's, that's how stupid sin will make you. And Noah is the pointing, Jesus pointed us to Noah. Listen to what Hebrews 11 says about Noah in the great hall of fame, of, uh, uh, the faith hall of fame uh, chapter in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. By faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something he couldn't see, and he acted on what he was told. The result? His family was saved. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the rightness of the believing world. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. Here's what you need to understand. As dark as it was in Noah's day, Noah found intimacy with God. You don't have to let the culture affect your relationship with God. You can walk with God no matter how darkening it gets in the culture. And just so you know, there is no government, there is no political leader that can do anything to stop the works of God in the earth. Now, the Bible says pray for godly leaders so that we can live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty and that the gospel can be preached in free course and without, and without oppression and without persecution. But do you know, how many of you know the government of China is a little bit contrary to Christians? They've been persecuting them for decades and decades. And do you know that today in China, one million people are coming to Christ every day in, the, in China. We have missionaries supporting this. We serve right there, right now. The most hostile of governments, communist government, against the work of God, and they, have not, they can't stop what God's doing. And, and no human force can stop what God's doing. The only thing that can stop what God's doing is us. It's whether we do what Noah did or we do what we see others doing. I see two extremes in the church world today. I see people rising up and saying, we are going to go into the darkness. We are going to bring the message of a Savior. We are not going to make people with whom we disagree our enemy. We're not going to hate people. We're not going to be angry against people. We are going to bring the light of the gospel to them. Whether they receive or reject, I have no control over. That's their decision before God. But our responsibility is to do what Noah did. The Bible said he was warned of something that he couldn't yet see. And he built a boat on dry land. And, and it took him decades and decades and decades and decades and decades to build this thing. And don't you know that people had to think he was nuts? Don't you know people had to go by and... and, and and, and see him and think, oh, man, is nuts. Don't you know somebody had to come to Noah and say, hey, no, let me talk to you. What are you doing? Dude, you've been doing this for years. If you're going to build a boat, maybe you might want to move near the water. Because there really wasn't, you know, the apparatus to carry the boat. There. And, but God warned him of something he didn't see. And he obeyed what God told him to do. And the result, listen, was that his family was saved. His family was saved. And what I want to talk to you about today, as your pastor, there is a, a, this impending, I'm, when I tell you, I, I feel like a watchman on the wall, and I'm watching an invading army come against a group of people who are asleep, who have no idea that there's a coming flood. And I see Christians doing one of two extremes, running toward the darkness to bring light to, to hurting, broken people without hope and without God, and then I see people sound asleep doing just what they said in the days of Noah, going to work, paying their bills, getting married, giving in marriage, and not aware that a flood was coming. I want you to understand something. There, and if you don't need to, I mean, listen, if you, in the last, in the, just in the last five years, you don't have to have any spiritual sensitivity to realize there's a flood coming. And if we don't act in concert with the will of God in this day, we are going to lose things so sacred to us 
And I don't mean stuff and freedom, which is sacred. I'm talking about our children. I'm talking about the most sacred, the most precious thing in your world, your family. And so I want to take a moment and let you, I want you to see just a three or four minute video of a family in our church who I've known for many, many years. Bill and Sandy Camp, I, I, I knew, actually I met Sandy when I was probably about 13 or 14 years old. And I've, and I've known their family for years. In fact, when Michelle and I were missionaries in Africa, they supported us in ministry. When I was traveling in churches, they supported us. And then when the church started, several years into the church, they started coming here. Now, how many of you know who Chris Camp is, their son? Chris teaches your kids in blast. He's a remarkable teacher. But let me tell you, I used to be his, I used to be his youth pastor. And we, I remember a time with Chris when we were doing an all-night lock-in at a bowling alley. If you want to have fun, go, to, go with 70 to 100 teenagers. Spend all night bowling with him. You, you, let me tell you, you will be glad it's over when it's over. And my job mainly was to make sure everyone had fun and no one died. Okay? And, but, you know, you're always keeping track and you always know that one kid that's going to disappear. Chris Camp was that kid. And I'm looking for Chris. I can't find him. And there were several floors to this bowling alley and, and, and we went... We, so I, I finally find Chris, and there's a, an area where there's pool tables. And Chris is paying, playing pool with about five bikers. So I go over, you know, because I, I don't want to start a fight. I'll lose. And I'm walking, hey, Chris. Hey, Pastor John. Hey, come here. Yeah. I, come on back. We're going to go bowling. He said, I'll be down in a minute. I need to finish my game. And I said, oh, Okay. And finally, we got, I got him out of there and we got him away from, you know, the, you know, you don't want a 14. I, I didn't want to lose him. How would you like to call Bill and Sandy? Hey, I know you love all your kids. We just lost one of them. <laughs> well, Bill and Sandy are, are, have made such an impact in this church and in their families' lives. And so what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we're going to show you a legacy story of Bill and Sandy this week and then their kids who come here. They're, you're going to see the story of their life and then their grandkids who come here. Can I tell you this? The most difficult thing to have today in the church is a multi-generational church. And I'll tell you why. Because a multi-generational church requires the younger generation to honor those that are older, and it requires the older generation to lay down their preferences. Bill and Sandy, as you'll hear them mention, they don't come here because they like the music. If you're, if you're in your 60s or 70s or 80s and you come here, it's because you love what's happening here. You tolerate this stuff. You really do, and it's okay. And if you're here and you see people my age and, and a lot older walking around this building, you honor those people. You thank God for those people because they put up with stuff they hate for you. <laughs> it's true. We honor those people. That's why we have valet parking. No, I'm serious. Because you're at a certain age, it's a big old parking lot, it's cold outside. You come up right to the door, someone who's young and can bear the cold, baby, will park your car. So why do we do that? Because we are going to honor people who are making sacrifices, who are listening to music that they're going, oh, Jesus, I love you and I want to worship you, but that's hard. And that light just got my eyeballs again. Would you just turn that light off? <laughs> but if we're going to have a multi-generational church, you've got to have honor, and then you have to have a group of people that are willing to lay down their preferences. Bill and Sandy are such a couple. Take a look at this and we'll get right, we'll get right back into the message. Hi, I'm Bill, and this is my beautiful wife, Sandy. And we first met Pastor John through, actually, Sandy did, through his mother. Uh, Patty and I got born again and filled with the Holy Spirit during that time when uh, that was first happening in the Catholic Church. And so we met up with each other at different meetings all over Beaver County. We'd go to every one, and Pastor John got dragged along with his mom, and that's how we met him. He was still a young boy. And then when uh, he went to Africa, we supported him over there. And we were so excited when they moved back to Beaver County and said uh, that they were going to start a church. The cinema days were different. Uh, it was amazing how many people came. As soon as you smelled the popcorn being popped, you knew you had like five more minutes and we had to get out of there. We had one room and uh, as the church quote unquote grew, 
Uh, we took over the second theater room, which was for the child care. And he would get up and preach and uh, very good. And we loved the way he taught the word and how true, the truth in it and how it helped us and how it would help everybody. But his whole vision wasn't this huge church. It was the people. And I think that's what impacted us an, an awful lot. We never realized it would grow to this uh, magnitude, which it has, and how many lives it would change. But we knew that vision would be fulfilled. So even though some of it, it's more contemporary and all that, now that we would probably prefer, it's still okay. We sing we, the, the songs, we do that, because we know that God's doing a great thing there. These people that are now, how do I want to say it? It's such a horrible world out there now things so difficult and they've come to a place where they can find out how to be free. So it's even more important today, as dark as it is, that we have a young church and there are young families coming in and there are young kids coming in and outreach programs, uh, the one that uh, Kay Little runs. I mean, it's just awesome things that are happening and it's not for anybody's glorification except for God's and turns their lives around these, you know, you talk to some of these young kids that are into everything and give their life to Christ and man. Hope for person. their future. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and we're so thankful that yeah. that, uh, what he had put into us in those early years has went into our children and right. all five of our kids saved, full, filled with the Holy Ghost and now into the grandchildren. So what could be better in life than yeah, that? Exactly. So, yeah, we've been very blessed, very blessed. And because uh, we, we love our family, that's what our whole life is about. And to see all of them, I mean, to us, that is uh, the most wonderful thing that they all know the Lord. And we'll talk about that. And just how wonderful. God's good. Yeah. <laughs> Blessing, huh? You know, Bill and Sandy a lot of years ago made a decision that they would build an ark to the saving of their family. And they got their kids involved in their church, in this church, and the things of God, and they invested in their kids' lives spiritually. And you know, as I said, it's the most difficult thing in our world today to see a multi-generational church. And the reason it exists here is because of the love of those in the older generation to lay down their preferences and the honor of those in, in the generation coming, to, to truly honor those who have, been, who have so much more life experience than we have. The building we're about to build, and I'm going to just take a few minutes and talk to you uh, today about the building and the process, and then we're going to get right back into the, the message of legacy and then celebrate communion together. The building we're about to build is an ark to the saving of our own families. This church this month is 23 years old. It started with Michelle and I and our son, who was six months old at the time. And there were three of us. And we just came and did what God led us to do. And, and what's resulted has been pretty remarkable. But what has happened every time we built as a church, we were always, everybody there was always thinking about somebody else. We were going to build to reach others, and, and we did it every time. And people were willing to invest their life. They already had a church. It was, it was packed and it was full and tough place to park, but they had a church. But they kept investing in the lives of other people. But what we're about to build now certainly is going to impact others' lives. And I'll really explain that to you in the next couple of weeks when we talk. I'll give you a little bit more detail about the 300 Church Initiative. Because everything we're doing here, we're helping other churches to duplicate it and that, that, to, to charge headlong into the darkness, not retreat. But we are about to build an ark to the saving of our families. The space that we need to build is because we're out of space for kids. We've gone to a 9 and an 11 weekend service on Sunday, not because we needed space in this room. We, we had more than enough seats to stay in one service. Why did we do it? Because we were running out of space with our kids. Do you know how many people in this church are now serving 
two services because to pull a service off here at Victory, you need to understand we need hundreds of people because there are people serving your kids all over this building. And there are people that showed up here at 7 o'clock this morning that will leave at 1 o'clock this afternoon because they care about kids and next generation kids. Now, if we can solve that problem in a way to go back to one service for a period of time, we'll do it. Eventually, we'll have to go to two because I want to be, I want to be very sensitive to the people that are making those investments. So I like two services. If you showed up at seven, left at one, you might not like it as much. But here's the point. We, we, we are laying a foundation for the next generation. In those spaces, we are going to, in that space we're going to build, we are going to create more space for kids. We are going to take our, our offices that we, remaining offices, we've already evacuated a bunch of our office space and, and, and renovated it for kids to make more space. It's full. And we've got literally people on our staff in closets. My favorite one, as I told you, is Steve Moore's in a closet back here. It's perfect. <laughs> but here's the deal. Yeah, and then we're going to evacuate the remaining 8,000 square feet of our offices. And as we, as we create some office space that we'll build, and that will be renovated for kids. And so we are investing, but here's the deal. We're doing it so that on weekends, you have small group space. We have children's space, because here's, what here's what's in my heart. And I have to tell you, I feel like, like I'm a watchman on the wall and I see a wave of death coming. I, families today are under such assault. Our children are growing up in a world where the pervasive darkness is so overwhelming. If they are not equipped with the Word of God, they are going to fail. The only offensive weapon you have as a Christian, the Bible calls it the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I want to create an environment as, as your pastor. We already have great small groups running, and it's fantastic. And, and, and we have our, our great push, in the, you know, it starts in February, then again in the fall. But what we want to be able to do is to offer on weekends, small groups during church for families, what we call parent-wise, an eight-week program where you're able to listen to teaching about how to be a godly parent and be connected to a mentor, somebody who's already been through the, the parenting maze and sometimes we could say torture and has the scars to prove it. Because the Bible says God's plan is for the older to teach the younger. But if we don't have a multi-generational church... What churches usually have are either all older or all younger. And how can the older teach the younger if they're not in the same place? And that's what God's doing here. And we're going to be able to create an environment. And it's, here's what's in my heart. In the next couple of years, I want to see a thousand parents go through ParentWise. It, during those times in our, in our weekend services, you'll be able to go to a marriage class to have your marriage enriched. To be able, because I'm telling you guys, I'm telling you, People that are growing in this world today or coming up in this world, even Christians, don't have a clue of what it means to operate with the Word of God in the context of their marriage, their family, and raising their kids. When I tell you they are completely void of understanding, it's not because they aren't good people. It's because they're just so ignorant. And we want to create this environment. I made another decision that because we, I'm telling you, I am sold out to reaching our families, sold out to creating an environment where your kids will possess the gates of their enemy, where this world will not own your children, but your children will navigate this and live a godly life and walk with God all their life. It's so important. How many of you know we have something called First Wednesdays? This Wednesday, Dr. Henry Cloud's going to be here at 7 o'clock. How many of you are coming to hear Dr. Cloud, man? I mean, do not miss that. It's, it's going to be incredible. But can I tell you this? After Dr. Cloud and then in, in December, our first Wednesday is the K-Love concert here. If you, if you want to come to that, that's, that's all online. And then I'm, going to, I'm stopping first Wednesdays for, for, I don't know, for the extended future. And let me tell you why. Because what we're going to do is on Wednesdays, when we get into the small group starting next year and in the fall, is that we are going to have a Wednesday family night where you can come here with your family Mom and dad can either go to a marriage class, a marriage enrichment class. We have classes for, broke, for broken families, blended families, where you can walk through this with people who have been through it. People that you can go through your parent-wise classes, and we will have small groups for your kids here in the building in an eight-week period of time. It is so important. It's, you say, well, Pastor, what about all the people that were coming in on first Wednesdays? I'll just start bringing them in on weekends. 
I'll bring them here to you. But here's my point, is that I am desperate. I, we must build an ark to the saving of our house. And I'm desperate to see you win this battle. I'm desperate to win this battle for my kids, my grandkids. I don't have any yet, but I'm counting on them, just so you know. And just so you know, pray for my grandchildren, because I, I before God, I, I vow to ruin them and utterly make them wish their parents were like their grandparents. <laughs> but I want to see, with all of my heart, these things come to pass. Now, the, now, we need to build a building to do it. Now, let me be even plainer, because you know I'm never plain. Let me be plain. I know that the size of this building bothers people. I get that. I can't tell you how many times people have come to me through the years. Why does that church need to be so big? I love this one. Why was all that money wasted? What must that sound like to God? There is nothing on planet Earth that should be going to scale like the church. Amen. People are scale, oh, we're scale this company, scale that company. We need to grow, we need to scale. Let me tell you what needs to scale. The kingdom of God needs to scale. Amen. This needs to grow. This needs to expand. Because the only hope of this world it's not economic. It's not political. It is a person, Jesus, and his church. It is the only hope of the world. And it is our hope to see 300 churches in this region come to the same conclusion. And I'm being very plain. I know when you come into a campaign like this, people have questions, and I want to answer those questions. But I also want you to know that I make no apology for investing in the next generation. Jesus said, permit the little children to come to me. It would be better for you to kill yourself than to off offend a little child. And when I stand before God, I refuse to love money more than his people. I refuse to love money more than the next generation. I refuse to serve money or the lack of it. We are going to do the will of God, and we will trust God in what God orders he pays for. And we've seen it happen for 23 years, and it's going to continue. God is faithful. And I, so many times through the years, I've had people come to me and quote the Bible. And they say this, this money could have been given to the poor. I, you know, and you may be thinking that. And every time someone's asked me that question, this quickly I ask back. How much do you give to the poor every month? And not one person has ever given a penny. It's not a part of their normal life. What, in fact, can I tell you this? If you're going to quote the Bible, don't quote Judas. <laughs> That's what Judas said about money. That Jesus was being anointed for burial, and he said, why this waste? What must it sound like to a Savior who shed blood to hear his people say, why this waste? The, we should lavish our best on Jesus. Amen. We should lavish our best on the kingdom of God and see the kingdom of God expand. And that's not only a financial thing, that's a heart thing. Where your treasure is, your heart is also. So we have a two-year campaign. And what we're going to do is build 20,000 square feet of new construction and renovate 8,000 square feet. We have a financial goal in the next two years to raise $5 million dollars. Three of it will go toward the building and two million to pay down debt. And let me tell you why we're paying down debt. Because we want to leave a legacy to our children in this church of giving them a debt-free church. Don't you wish our government felt the same way? I think one of the most obscene things that have, it's happened in our, in our nation is we have political leaders who are literally mortgaging our great-grandchildren's future for stuff they want to consume today wasting our children's future. It's like, it's like you, you're dying, so you run your credit card up, and so when you die, your kids can pay it off because you wanted some stuff. We live in a nation that is so self-consumed that we are willing to consume and destroy the financial futures of our children so that someone can have their next free whatever. And it's crazy. See, God agrees. You heard that. He's clear. That's God clapping. Just so you know, y'all won't clap. God will clap. There you go. I'm telling you. But sincerely, and we're going to hand this church off debt free. But let me tell you about the commitment that we've made as a church not to borrow money. I went to a group of leaders that have been so committed to this church a, a, a while back, about almost, uh, I guess almost a year and a half ago. And I asked them to help give toward some projects. And now I'm going to ask you to come behind and help finish it. And these individuals 
gave $1.4 million, and here's what they paid for, cash. The extension road to Ehrman Road, 286000 cash paid. Middle school and children's renovations, when we threw everybody out of their offices, $152,000 of renovations paid for in cash. We had to pay for the staffing of the next generation staff because it wasn't in budget, $102,000 of all the staff we added. And that's paid for, cash, and now in budget. All the architectural and engineering you need to build a new building and all the, the fees you have to pay and the, and the extortion, I, I mean the fees you have to pay, $300,000 paid for in cash. And there's $540,000 plus dollars sitting in a bank waiting to do this project. And when you add your $3 million in cash, we will pay this thing debt-free and we'll build it debt-free and we will have a debt-free ark for the saving of our families. Amen. So I want to ask you with sincerity in my heart to pray about the part you're supposed to take in building, this, in building this place for our families, building this for our marriages, building this for our future. This isn't even about reaching outside of our church right now. This is about reaching our own families. And, and we need it. And so I'm asking every person to pray about what they can do over the next two years. In, you should have received a brochure, a, f a fulfilled brochure when you came in. If you didn't, you can pick one up on the way out. Within it is, is a commitment card. And, and, and on the weekend of the 12th and 13th of November, we're going to come that weekend and we're, I'm asking you to bring your commitments. You don't have to wait till then. You can send it in, drop it in an offering. You can do it online. And then the following weekend, I'll announce to you the commitments of the amount that's been pledged. And then that weekend, we'll receive a special offering, a launch offering of the campaign. And the more quickly the finances come in, once it gets to a certain point, we'll know, okay, we can now get, we can start building. Just so you know, we can build it right now. Our bank, and just so you know, churches, are, uh, banks are not lining up to lend money to churches. Here's what our bank told us. They didn't ask for us to raise any money. They'd loan us every penny we need because our church is, operates very wisely financially. And the bank said, w w just, we'll give you whatever you need because they know that this church has, has a history of paying its, its debt. But that's not what we're here. I, it's in my heart that we pay cash for everything Amen. because that's what we want to leave for our kids. And I've, I'm just praying that that heart gets in our, our politicians, that we just start thinking about the future. And, I want to, and we want to see this happen across, just not here, but across other churches as well. So I'm asking you to please pray about your part. And, and some of you that like, maybe some of you are like Michelle and I. We don't have money in the bank per se. I'm just being candid with you. We, are, we have two kids in college. One just graduated. <laughs> I don't have, he is gone. But what we have done is we're making a decision with our monthly income and making a significant commitment ourselves. Why? Because we go to this church too. And I want to encourage every one of you to do your part. There are almost 9,000 plus people that go to this church. This is their church. And if we will do our part, everybody, and I would say this as well, some of you I have the capacity and God will lead you to do something significant financially. And, and we need people to honor God and obey him that way. I'm not suggesting what anybody should do, but I am telling you that we are called to build an ark of the saving of our house. And I want to encourage you to take whatever step God puts in your heart. You know, as we wind down this morning, Bill and Sandy, many years ago, when we were at our building way over on Freedom Road. Bill came up to me and gave me a gift for this church that uh, we had one gift outside of the church came in that was larger, but it was, it's, been the, it's the largest gift ever given from within this church. And, 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 and at that point, he was in his 60s. And he, he saw the future. And I think of every person that's come to know Christ since. Those of you who have known, come to know Jesus through this church or have your life turned around in the last five, ten plus years, you stand on the shoulders of people like Bill and Sandy Camp, people that gave with you in mind. And there is a generation coming, and these are our own children, that will either stand on our shoulders or they will fall. The scripture said we will not hide these truths from our children. And as your pastor, I just want you to know, I'm not, I'm not bending. I'm, I, will, I will trust God and do my very best. It may not be adequate, but I will do my very best to lead you to make financial decisions to be able to prepare an ark to the saving of our own families. Because I'm telling you, there is a darkness, a wave of darkness coming on this earth. 
in our own nation that is coming and it's coming to take what is most precious not your stuff not your success your family and you don't have to let it happen no noah became intimate with god right in the middle of it and here's what i'm telling you i'm believing god for that we will become intimate with god our children and our grandchildren will become intimate with god right in the middle of all this darkness and and then we're going to run into the darkness and we're going to bring the message of hope and a savior to a world without christ they're not our enemy they're our target they're our mission field that's the difference and I really want to encourage you when you leave today, you stop at the wall, the it will be fulfilled wall, and you write down your faith declaration. And I just want to encourage you as, you, as, we, as, we, as, we, as we go into a time of communion, Jesus, in fact, let me say this, if you, if you haven't received the elements, raise your hand, the ushers will get these to you. Just keep your hand up, they'll find you. But let me say this to you, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice. You talk about a gift. God so loved the world that he what? Gave. When love captures your heart, giving is the next, the next response. Communion is actually a time when we celebrate the legacy of Jesus. But before we get to communion, I want to make sure that everybody here knows Jesus as the Lord of their life. I want to make sure that everybody here, that if today you drew your final breath and were to slip into an eternity, do you know where you'd spend it? Jesus said there is a heaven to gain, and Jesus said there is a hell to shun. And I want to make sure, certain before we celebrate communion together, that everyone here has had the opportunity to make Jesus the Savior of your life. Every head bowed, please, and every eye closed. If you're here today and you'd say to me, Pastor John, I don't know that if I drew my final breath where I'd spend it. But I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to know him as the Savior of my life. I believe he died on the cross to bear my sin. He rose from the dead so I could be saved. And I want to receive Christ as the Lord of my life. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ and you want to, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. I'll pray for you right where you're seated. The whole church, in fact, will pray that prayer out loud and together with you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. I'll pray for you right there. No one's going to single you out or embarrass you. Say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just simply raise your hand right where you're seated and I'll pray for you. Thank you, thank you. God bless you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Thank you, God bless you. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. One last moment. You've not yet raised your hand. You desire to be included in that prayer. His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Well, thank you, God bless you. One last moment, I want to wait on you to make sure that you know Christ as the Lord of your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just let one last moment to be certain that you know him. Wonderful, thank you. Listen, if you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud where you hear it with your own ears. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Pray it where you hear it and we'll pray it together with you. Say it out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my heart and the door of my life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be my Savior and to be my Lord. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin is washed away. I am heaven bound. And I confess boldly that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen. Would you give them a hand, please? Best decision of your life. God bless you. If you pray with me, we'll give you some further instruction right at the end of the service. But we're going to celebrate communion now. Would you stand together with me? In a moment, I'm just going to share a few thoughts with you. And then our worship team is going to lead us in a song right after we receive communion. And then they'll dismiss you shortly. But let's just come together. This is so sacred. Communion is a time when you remember what Jesus said. But when he shared with it, what he actually gave the revelation to the Apostle Paul, he said on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, now listen, this is my body, which is broken for you. And after they had eaten, he took the cup and he said, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Jesus was talking about giving his body and his blood for your salvation and my salvation. Communion is a time 
when it says in Corinthians that we are to examine our own heart. What do we examine our own heart in light of? Not our failures, not our past, not the things that have happened to us badly, but we examine ourselves in light of his mercy, in light of his love. And when you hold these elements in your hand, here's what you're saying when you partake of them, that I no longer will elevate my past or anything above the love and the mercy and the grace and the blood of a Savior who set me free. And I will examine my heart. Communion is a time when you recognize the legacy of a Savior who shed his blood to make you free. And we, it goes on in the next chapter, he actually, he actually talks about communion being a place where you discern your part in, in the body of Christ. In the next chapter, he talks about taking your place. Communion is a time when you reckon that you're not an individual on your own. You are a child of God, members one of another, a part of a body. And what you do in the body of Christ or what you don't do matters. And he said, examine yourself. So as we celebrate the legacy of a Savior today, take out the, the, the wafer which, re which represents his body. We're going to pray together and we're going to eat and then drink together. And immediately the worship team is going to take us into a song of worship. So grateful for the love, grace, and mercy of God in your life and the, this, this campaign to take our next step as a church. Let's just rejoice together with our Savior as we celebrate communion together. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for a Savior that shed his blood and died for us. Oh, we love you, Father. We love you. And Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood on our behalf. Thank you for loving us. We examine our hearts today and we thank you for our Savior that is greater than our past, greater than our sins, greater than our failures, greater than our disappointments. And we realize the last thing you told us, Jesus, when you left this earth was to go and bring this message of redemption to the whole world and to make disciples of all nations. So we humble ourselves in your presence and we celebrate and remember the legacy of our Savior who is alive forevermore, who shed his blood on our behalf so that we could be free, so that we could walk in newness of life with a living God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Break, eat, and drink, and let's worship.